that, I would ask the Councilor 124626, State of Kansas versus Brian Curtis Daniels Jr. to come forward. Well, they do so, I will um, explain also that the court does have notes before it, uh, some of us on computer, some on paper. And you will see us frequently looking at those notes or making additional notes. Um, I just want to assure the parties, council, and those who are watching that as we do so, we are still attentively listening. Those are just processes that help us assimilate the arguments. So that, Ms. Reynolds? May it please the court. Hope Fafleck Reynolds appearing on behalf of Mr. Daniels. Um, Chief Justice Lukert, may I please reserve five minutes of rebuttal? Five minutes is reserved. Thank you. Thank you. This case presents a single issue, which is how Mr. Daniels prior conviction for burglary in Georgia should affect his criminal history. Yeah. Or we'll just pause. We'll just pause your time and uh, let's and um, sorry for the interruption. I'll, hopefully you don't lose your chain of thought. I would if it were me. I imagine. <laughs> sorry, Chief. No, no problem. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, and I apologize for the interruption, but I, this gives us a good sound quality for um, future use of the argument, so thank you. Is this working now? Okay. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, this court's holding in Bush and the plain text of the Kansas sentencing statute require us to look at the elements of the Georgia burglary conviction, not the facts or the circumstances surrounding the conviction. The word circumstances is used in the statute, but only regarding the list. Um, the relevant portion of which we're talking about is subsection G, um, habitat, dwelling, or residence. Um, that's, not, that's not the way in which we evaluate prior out-of-state sentencing. We look at the elements, which was again, on the text of the statute in subsection little i and triple i, which this court interpreted in, in Bush. The other reason that we do that that is really important is because it avoids a thicket of constitutional issues with judicial fact-finding at sentencing. It's clear that when the legislature redid the sentencing scheme to enact the statute, they were hoping to avoid those constitutional problems. It's also clear that the type of work the state is asking Mr. Daniels to do is not how the statute's written. The state in its supplemental brief expects Mr. Daniels to produce journal entries about the facts of how he was charged with burglary in Georgia. Well, That's I'm going to I'm going to push back on that just a little bit. And let's back up to the sentencing hearing itself. Mm -hmm. This statute under the conviction code has three letters, three designations. Mm -hmm. A stands for adult, F stands for felony, and P stands for person. So it, in Corby, uh, it was established that, um, uh, that the classification was also admitted by the defendant when he said, yes, I... Uh, I admit to the criminal history. In Corby, however, the difference between an, a, a felony and a misdemeanor designation determined the result because the misdemeanor was non-person. All of the felonies under that statute were person felonies. But the P stands for person. 
Now, we have case law to indicate pretty clearly that the person designation is a conclusion of law to be made by the court in this very case. So what is the effect of the defendant's answer to the judge's question, do you admit criminal history? Yeah, so that is on page two of volume four, which is the sentencing hearing. Um, and the district court judge asks Mr. Daniels, do you agree to this criminal history? And he says, yes. Um, the plea agreement that they were basing that on also in subsection 14, which is page 26 through 28 of volume one of the record, specifically preserves his right to challenge his criminal history on appeal. Um, as to your honor's question about um, the effect of Corby on this case, I think that Corby is different for several reasons. First, Corby dealt with prior in-state crimes. In Kansas, fleeing and eluding can be a felony or a misdemeanor. And this court said in Corby that when somebody agrees in district court, I was convicted of felony fleeing and eluding in Kansas, they cannot then say the state didn't prove that on appeal. Corby is about the burden of proof. Corby is not about what it takes to show um, the burden. Corby just argued that the state didn't meet its burden and didn't say this is incorrect. This case is different. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead. Well, this case is different because there's no world in which the elements of the Georgia statute require a circumstance listed in the Kansas statute. It's not a factual question of was he convicted of this type of Georgia burglary or this other type of Georgia burglary. The statute says, the Kansas sentencing statute says, we look at the elements of the prior out-of-state conviction and we see, do they require, do they necessarily include any of these circumstances in the Kansas statute? And they don't. There is no world in which the Georgia elements require, as this court has interpreted that word, one of the circumstances in the Kansas statute. And that is why, even if it is Mr. Daniel's burden to show his criminal history is incorrect, he can do that just on the face of the statutes, which are written to operate as a matter of law and as a legal conclusion not as a factual inquiry, which is where we get those problems. Well, can uh, Mr. Daniels admit to a conclusion of law? I don't think so, Your Honor. Um, this is also, I, I would understand a different case. That's not this one. Um, if he made a different argument in district court, like an invited error issue, and this court has case law um, with, precluding parties from switching legal arguments midway through a case. Um, but that's, that's not what happened here. Here, he agreed he had a prior Georgia conviction. And the issue is, how should Kansas law treat that conviction at sentencing? Let me ask you a question. And, you know, I, I think something is going over my head because I don't understand it. When you look at the Georgia law, it says you commit burglary when with or without authority with intent to commit a felony within you enter or remain within a dwelling house of a you know of any building you know of it okay dwelling house of another or any building vehicle blah 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 that's used as a dwelling and then so that's kind of the dwelling part of it or enters or remains within any other building, railroad, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, that fits B little I H entering or remaining within any dwelling. Yeah. So um, your honor is correct that the word dwelling is present in the Georgia statute, but the statute goes on to designate other forms for burglary under Georgia law. And those include a vehicle, a rail car, a watercraft, or any other structure designed for use of the dwelling of another. So that means that um, Georgia law does not require proof of entering or remaining within a dwelling habitat or structure as listed in the Kansas circumstance. Are you saying that there's no way the state could have met a burden to show that the Georgia conviction 
would qualify as a person felony and go forward. I mean, it's just, just impossible. Doesn't That's, matter what this guy says. It is literally impossible. That's what I don't get. I think I think that be, the way the legislature wrote the sentencing law, because it's based on the elements of the out-of-state jurisdiction, under that law, there is no world in which the state can prove a Georgia burglary counts as a person felony because its elements do not require. I thought that the burden of proof we were discussing is not any burglary, but rather this burglary. Right. So why couldn't the state prove that this burglary is comparable? I I think that they could try, um, but in this case, they didn't. And the issue well, is- But that gets back to the whole burden of proof question. I mean, I, I do understand, at least I think I understand your argument being, yes, the statute may put the burden of proof on us, but we don't actually have to demonstrate any facts because we went on the law. Right. Um, but if you don't actually win on the law, then are we back stuck with state's argument, as I understand it, which is there are facts out there that matter, and it's not our burden to come forward with those facts. I don't think so, because I think that contravenes the plain text of the Kansas sentencing statute, which requires us to look at the elements. Um, I also think that the way the Georgia statute is written, each of those forums are in one subsection. And this that mattered to this court when it decided Bush, where the prior burglary conviction was a non-person felony, the New Jersey burglary conviction, but the criminal trespass conviction was okay to count as a person felony because of the divisibility of the statute, which is a difference here. So you're you're arguing that just because the Georgia statute by its elements is broader than the Kansas statute, as a matter of law, it can never be comparable, even if the facts of the case fit the Kansas statute. Yes, Your Honor. Well, in that's um under subsection. Sorry, Justice Wilson. Th that's the argument really hinges on the little three and the language there that if it's not required to prove the elements of uh, a residential burglary because there are maybe alternative means of committing that crime, uh, that's the matter of law argument you're making. So the factual question really is moot. If, if, is that your argument? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. But what about the word any? Do not require proof of any of the circumstances. Oh, it's just, sorry, Justice Wilson, go ahead. Well, in, in Bush, that on the criminal trespass, that also turned on whether it was a felony or a misdemeanor, didn't it? Because he admitted the criminal history, including the, the that it was a felony, and the only felony in the divisible criminal trespass statute was a person felony, required that it be done in a residence, correct? That's my understanding of the New Jersey criminal trespass statute, yes. So the only thing that the court needed to, uh, information the court needed to make the decision in Bush was that it was a felony because then it necessarily did include a residence, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Now, um, going back to the criminal history, is there any other significance, factual significance, that can be inferred by the court in making a conclusion of law on whether it's person or non-person from Daniel's blanketed agreement to the criminal history? I'm going to see if I understand your question. Are you asking what the significance of the stipulation is regarding the legal classification of the conviction? What is the significance, the fact significance of the blanket admission by Mr. Daniels that he agrees with the criminal history as questioned by the court? So he's barred from challenging the existence of that conviction in the future. He is barred from, or at least carries the burden of demonstrating if there's some defect in which portion of the statute he is convicted under because it lists the statute and then it has that AFP designation that your honor mentioned. Um, but as far as the legal classification, 
I think that under this court's law, he is unable to agree to an illegal sentence and is therefore free to challenge his sentence as illegal, which is different than Corby because he only might have agreed to an illegal sentence. Here, it's clear he did as a matter of law, which this court has long prohibited. I see my time has expired, Chief Justice. I'll be back for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Lance Gillette on behalf of the state of Kansas. From the state's position, the resolution of this case is actually fairly straightforward, although along the path, we are asking for a little bit of help uh, in helping to understand Bush and exactly how it was, how it is to be applied going forward. The first point that is absolutely clear is that under 216814 subsection C, the burden is now definitively upon the defendant to demonstrate the illegality of his sentence by challenging his criminal history. Is there any indication, any any underlying facts, testimony, uh, basis for the court's legal conclusion that this was a person felony other than the P designation and the PSI report and the admission? The statute says that the defendant's ad that the defendant's admission alone and along with that pre-sentence investigation are sufficient. Um, so we would have to presume that he was also admitting to the P in addition to the F and the A and the existence of a conviction, correct? Correct. I think that's what that admission means. But you agree the P designation is a legal conclusion? Uh, yes. Is the defendant qualified? To make a legal conclusion, the court is also charged to make in this very case? Uh, with the advice of counsel, I mean, individuals are charged with knowing the law, number one. Number two, he is acting here with the advice of counsel who also agreed, admitted and agreed to the criminal history score. That doesn't really answer my question. Is he qualified to make a legal conclusion, which P is? And our case law is very clear on that. I mean, res respectfully, I think that the answer has to be yes. If, if when he's doing something, he knows his criminal history as better, if not better. No, than but he does. Else. You know, I hear that argument all the time. From sure. State. Defendants know their criminal history. How, when we can't figure out the what the classification. Yes, they may know what crimes they've committed, but even that, if you go back five, ten years, and you you have a, a list here, maybe they know, maybe they don't know. At least that's was my experience with with uh, handling sentencing. But if we can't figure out what the classification is, how can how can uh, someone sitting there say, yeah, my Georgia conviction is a person felony? I mean, how, how does that work? You, you mean, can't be, you can't be serious to say that that's a legal conclusion that they can stipulate to and they can I'm quite, understand. I'm, I'm quite serious. The only question here is whether that Georgia prior occurred in a dwelling. That's the only question that makes it person or non-person. That's not a complicated question at all. Well, does, Where did does, I burgle? Does that violate Apprendi then? No, it does I, not. Based on this court's prior case law in and started with Dickey, Wetrich, Murdoch, that whole line of case law back then. What we're talking about here is divining the elements of the prior offense. Now, what I'm asking is, does it violate Apprendi for the court to ask a defendant to make an admission that enhances his criminal history. I I don't believe that it would. Um, I also don't know, I don't believe that that question is before this court respectfully in this, in this particular brief, but I don't believe that it would because we're not talking about a factual finding. Well, in your sub supplemental brief, you mentioned the few documents that under day camp that the court can consider under the modified categorical approach in enhancing a defendant's criminal history. And one of them isn't uh, isn't a PSI report, at least not that I've seen or that's been decided, and certainly not the ability to ask a defendant to make an admission. The court has the duty to to inquire. The defendant doesn't have to admit. He can challenge that PSI, and it is that challenge at the time of sentencing 
at which point we could then progress and apply, I believe we can still apply the modified, the categorical, modified categorical approach, post Bush even. It appears that that is the, the, the status of the law. Can the P be interpreted to be anything other than a uh, conclusion of law? I don't believe- In the PSI that. report, the P designation of person felony, can that be considered by this court as anything other than a conclusion of law? In this case, no. Um, can I imagine an, another case where, I mean, I think we dealt with that a little bit in, in the Dickey cases where, uh, where we were talking about start delving into having to make um, factual findings to support or to determine that question, then we could run into a problem. But here we're not talking about any kind of a factual finding to support the P person felony classification. Well, but doesn't it, law. doesn't it have to be a factual finding in order for it to be evidence? Uh, no, no. For the court to consider. I mean, you're asking the court to make a conclusion of law in this case based on someone else's conclusion of law in the same case, right? Unless you can designate the P as something other than a conclusion of law made by the defendant. Is it, can it be considered as I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question because <laughs> I'm, the PSI presumptively satisfies whatever the state's burden of proof is. I think it's well understood that we cannot engage in fact finding contrary to Apprendi here, but this court's precedents are replete with examples of the fact that a person designation is a question of law. And I think that 216811, the subsections that we're talking about here, they simply explain how that question of law is answered. Uh, the PSI, the admission, that all supports it. And if the defendant would like to now later challenge it, that burden is on him. And the statute also, 216814D, as of 2022, gives him a way to factually challenge, to now say, look, I made this admission, it was wrong. Counsel, I understand the whole argument to be, yes, I'm challenging the conclusion that this is a person felony as a matter of law, and I'm challenging it on the law. And you're, it just seems like you're your argument begs the question. I'm not saying you're wrong, but you're not addressing. It's like ships passing in the night here. And I think, frankly, it is because I don't think that the defendant's argument tracks the law under Kansas. Well, under why are Kansas they wrong? Law. Why are they wrong? Because in Georgia, whether or not a burglary occurred at a dwelling, and this is not refuted by the defense at all, is a question of law. It has to be alleged and proven in that prior case. But Georgia burglary is a divisible crime that not only does that does the dwelling have to be alleged, it must then be proved in order to support it. Help me out a little bit here. But <laughs> yes, I want to I want to rewind to let's assume the defendant doesn't stipulate. What do you have to prove in order to get this classification for this Georgia offense? We would have to demonstrate that as a matter of law, the elements of defendant's specific prior conviction, not just the Georgia statute in general, that his prior offense. How do you do that? ESI would be step one. Step two would be if there is if there is a challenge, assuming there's a challenge, to provide documentation that would support the conclusion as a matter of law that the prior occurred at a dwelling. would have to show that the Georgia burglary occurred in a dwelling as opposed to an airplane hangar, for example. Assuming the airplane hangar doesn't also have an apartment inside, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we would have to do that if that challenge is made at sentencing, correct. And so the coin is just flipped now. That burden is upon defendant to demonstrate that as a matter of law. I'd it's like possible. to explore the stipulation a little bit. Um, my understanding is he was asked if he agreed to the criminal history. When I look at the definition of criminal history in um, KSA 2168.03, it seems to me that that definition is just about the historical fact that there was a conviction. 
under a specific statute and nothing more. We have a different term defined as a criminal history score that does then seem to get into the way in which we score that on the matrix, um, on the grid. Um, and especially here where the plea agreement reserved a right to appeal and question the criminal history score, can we say this defendant did stipulate to this being a person felony? My answer would be, there's no reason why not. And the first thing, I, the second thing I would say is the defendant has not made any kind of a claim that his admission was not sufficient um, under 6803 uh, that your honor is now quoting. I would also note that the existence of a prior conviction would necessarily encompass the elements that as a matter of law are required to establish that prior conviction. So I don't think there is a substantive difference here at all. There is sort of a, a maxim, I guess is maybe the right word to use in the law that parties can't stipulate to the law. They can stipulate to facts. And aren't we here talking about a stipulation to a legal conclusion? I think we're we're talking about a stipulation to a legal conclusion that is that is based on established established facts. We're not we're not reevaluating any facts here. These things have already been established. They are unquestionable, unquestionably now matters of law. That's what that's what we're really talking about. Can you help me understand this your your statutory interpretation of 216811E3B little III, or at least how you would refute your opposing counsel's construction that it really doesn't even matter because when you have I don't know, you call it a divisible statute or uh several different um means of committing an offense that that language that that if the elements of the offense do not require proof of any of the circumstances um, above, then it's a non-person felony. Because under Georgia, when that law that law being divisible, a prosecutor from the very beginning is required to allege as an element the location of the prior crime. That is included in my brief. But but I, I think as I understand it. Their argument is that in our state, the legislature has decided in circumstances when another state defines an offense um, to include these alternative means that don't necessarily in every case require um, a residential um, burglary, then we're just, as a matter of policy, going to deem those offenses as um, non-person offenses based on that language. And my response to that would be, I guess it would be twofold, and it would be starting with um, subsection B, little i, and we're talking about um, in designating a felony crime, the felony crime shall be classified. We're talking about a specific felony crime. We're not talking about generally, and I don't believe generally that an out-of-state statute broadly and that's where i'm not i'm not frankly 100 percent certain that the court of appeals got this exactly correct uh, we're not we are talking about a specific prior offense and the subsection that your honors asked about as well talks about specifically an out-of-state conviction or, ju or adjudication if the elements of the offense we're talking about defendant specific offense we're not talking just blindly about a statute we still have the modified categorical approach available to us is my understanding following bush <clears throat> and i'll just as an to, to highlight that the ultimate problem in bush was that i believe even employing that approach there was no way to determine that a new jersey burglary contained a dwelling because it unlike georgia that's not strictly required as an element it but, can't be strictly required but, as no. But that's the um, that's the floor designation, isn't it? The modified categorical or categorical approach, the constitutional floor. Our legislature has the right to to 
broaden that or or make it even uh, even less restrictive on the defendant by saying what uh, what Justice Wall indicated as a matter of policy, if it's divisible, it's going to be non-person. Case closed. That's how we're going to score in Kansas for Kansas sentencing purposes uh, that conviction. I, I suppose it's possible for the legislature to rewrite the statute again to say that, but that's not what they've said with 2168.11 and, and the quote-unquote Wetrich fix. That's just not what they said. They haven't. Well, um, the, the defendant asserts that they did. They said, number one, the statute has to have one of these circumstances present, which the Georgia statute does, but one of those circumstances must be required for conviction. And I'm explaining to that defendant's prior conviction in almost certainly did require the element of a resident of a dwelling and the burden is on him based on his prior admissions to demonstrate that it did not occur to dwell i have no burden before this court today isn't that almost certainly in your answer I, it just opens the door to facts no i mean well i mean it opens the door to defendant trying to meet his burden to demonstrate that as a matter of law there his prior conviction did not occur the problem dwelling. i think or at least maybe the problem is almost certainly doesn't show up in the statute statute is as i think justice wilson was pointing out definitive it doesn't give you the wiggle room i don't i don't need the wiggle room and defendant cannot win with wiggle that's the, my point. The burden is upon him to demonstrate that his prior conviction did not include the dwelling element. So I think what you're saying is that 6811 has to be read in conjunction with 6814, which we have now clarified that, um, and even in Bush, you know, in Bush, there was, that's where we use the word none. I mean, there was nothing in that statute that talked about a dwelling. Correct. It was, there were no options. And that's why we said nothing. Okay, so that's where we interpreted the word, um, uh, did not require proof of any of the circumstances. Okay, Correct. nothing. Okay, here we clearly have a divisible statute. So we've not ruled on that. But we also have 6814, which clearly the legislature wanted to address this. You know what? When you're sitting there at sentencing, you better raise an issue. Yes. Okay, but we're not going to cut you off if you don't. Correct. Okay? You've got the PSI, and if you don't raise the issue, then um, then the PSI counts, and the judge, I mean, it says, the, the criminal history shall be admitted by the offender or determined by a preponderance of the evidence by the judge and that the PSI counts. That's enough. That's all you have to prove now. And then it talks about if you have a, a dispute about it, you got to go produce something that the state's got the burden, burden, burden. Okay. Now, if you want to bring it up here, you're allowed, you know, fact finding. If you want to bring it up here, then the defendant has to show when you have a modified divisible statute like this, sorry, modified categorical approach, divisible statute, they just show us, show us the journal entry from Georgia. Right. I mean, this is so clear that this is what the legislature wanted. Is that, that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. I think what, it is that simple. What I'm struggling with is what would the journal entry show on this statute? Because it's all under one subsection. Um, well, I mean, I, you don't usually see a journal entry talk about the facts that would differentiate the which part, which division of the statute you're under. And that's the site, the site to my brief again to pages 12 and 13. We're not talking about facts as a matter of law. Prosecutors in Georgia from the very beginning are required as an element to allege the location where a burglary took place and that in most circumstances under Georgia law, it's going to be a dwelling. 
That's, right, that, that's, so that's my mistake saying about, it's a journal entry. It could be any kind of proof. I was going to say, we're not talking about the journal entry, most likely. Sorry. It would be more like that was my point. a complaint, assuming that's the word they attach to the charging document. Yeah, a complaint. Uh, yeah, I think the list comes and is it, it's been listed. But yeah, there are a number of different documents that a defendant could produce. We saw that in Steiner, where there was an attempt, at least, for the defense to produce some journal entries from Arkansas. Unfortunately, they just weren't clear enough to carry his burden of proof. With Georgia, so what you're saying is really that, that that's what you would have had to prove had all the defendants said at, at the sentencing hearing is, hey, I, I object. Correct. We would just I object. That's all they would have said. I object. And then it would have been your burden of proof to produce whatever it is that that was. At the district court, correct. But now it's not. It's his burden. And, and he's I, done nothing to carry it. Um. A quick sort of textual question sure. um, in 68.11, well, I guess it's big B3, the uh -huh. provision we're all talking about, yeah. the, the um, any element or any circumstances, I mean, provision. Um, I want to draw your attention to the word offense. Is it significant at all, and does it impact your argument that the legislature chose the word offense there, elements of the offense, as opposed to the what I think is the more natural and regular way of talking about elements as elements of the crime? Is there any difference between it? And what I'm driving at is, it, can we read from that that what the legislature is talking about here is the actual offense as opposed to the abstract crime. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. The legislature intended to preserve the mo the categorical modified categorical approach. We're talking about a specific. So you're just saying as, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but just yep. real quick to clarify, your argument is that the plain language of subsection three supports your position because it clearly is referring to the particular offense as opposed to the general crime. Correct. And I think it does it multiple ways by saying an out-of-state conviction or adjudication of a felony offense and does it a felony offense again and then the they tried to be clear about that. There are no other questions. I know I've gone a little bit above, uh, beyond time, but this is a topic we've all been, we've all talked about a number of times. So I, I appreciate it. And I would simply ask the court to hold the defendant to his statutory burden at this point in time and to deny his, his claim. Thank you all. May it please the court, Hope Fafleck Reynolds, still on behalf of Mr. Daniels. Um, I think what this comes down to is that Mr. Daniels cannot stipulate to a legal conclusion. And the question in this case is a legal question about how his prior conviction should be treated under Kansas sentencing law. It's something the legislature has struggled with. It's something this court has struggled with. It is something that the parties have struggled with. It is not something that he can stipulate to in court. And so we are asking this court to um, reverse his sentence and vacate it with or remand it with instructions to reclassify the prior conviction. But under 6814, um, with this whole burden of proof situation, couldn't you have uh, submitted evidence up here? Doesn't that allow you to submit evidence up here um, to, to show that it was not, uh, did not include a, uh, a dwelling? Appellate rules allow adding journal entries. In this case, I don't know that the journal entry shows anything because like Chief Justice pointed out, everything is under subsection A. Um, I also don't think that it's necessary because this is a legal question based on the face of the statutes, the face of the Georgia burglary statute and its elements. Do but you... it says that the, if, the, if the offender later challenges the offender's criminal history, the burden of proof shall shift to the offender to prove such offender's criminal history by a preponderance of the evidence. Yes, that's sir. what the legislature said, and they changed that in 2021. This was this is a new, new. This mm -hmm. is a new language. Yes, and I would, I would 
maybe back up and say that because it's a legal question, um, it whether or not he had a Georgia burglary conviction is not the issue. Everybody agrees he was convicted of burglary in Georgia. Um, the facts of that conviction are not necessarily, we argue, relevant to how Kansas law should classify that conviction. So for you don't school. believe the modified categorical approach exists after um, when the legislature, I don't remember what year it was, um, changed the whole 6811 bye-bye modified categorical approach? I I think that it doesn't exist in this case on these facts. I think I can imagine cases in which it would well, apply. Why wouldn't, why isn't this the perfect case with a divisible statute? Um, because of the way the statute is written with the subsection. So I'm looking again at this court's opinion in Bush and how it treated the trespass statute versus the burglary statute from New Those Jersey. Those were two different statutes. Right. This is a divisible statute. Right. So again, to oversimplify because I'm still struggling. I still think you guys are talking past each other. And I'm just trying to find a way to analyze this. Let's assume that Georgia burglary was in a house. You're saying that doesn't matter because uh, because this, we have to interpret the statute to say that because of the way the Georgia statute is written, this can never be a personal a person felony. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. And can I just explore that precise question really quickly? And I really just want to hear your response to the exchange I had with State's counsel at the end of his presentation with respect to the text of subsection little, you know, 3I, I guess. Um, and it's that question of is, is that subsection talking about the elements of the actual offense at issue, or is it talking about, because you're arguing, no, this is talking about just the elements of the crime, because as you've said multiple times, we can just look at the face of the statute, and that ends the discussion. Yeah, so my interpretation would be that the word offense in little triple I um, refers back, is its antecedent is out-of-state felonies in little one I. Um, so offense is substituted for felonies. And when you read the statute as a whole, as this court has told us to do in statutory construction, I think that is clear. It's talking about an out-of-state felony or the offense. Um, so. the, um, the language of 2160-814-D, I'm going to flip you back to that statute, has struck me as odd before. And this case is kind of underlining, I guess, a distinction that, that the legislature chose to make there. And I, this goes to the language that I think is their attempt to, how does an appellate court become a fact-finding court? And so they talked about um, allowing the defendant to supplement the record with a journal entry. Um, but we've already talked about how in this kind of a case, the journal entry probably is not going to assist in the inquiry that we have to make. There's another sentence that allows the use of uh, complaints, verdict forms, other documents, but that is limited to taking judicial notice of Kansas records. It doesn't impact, as I read it at least, on uh, facially uh, out-of-state convictions. Is there anything that we can discern from legislative intent there that um, they really are back under um, 6811 trying to make a distinction on those out-of-state convictions that if we have to probe beyond the journal entry, we're not going, going to go there? I think, and I will say in practice, the legislature's exclusion of that mechanism um, in subsection D tells us that it's not allowed. It's only um, judicial notice for in-state issues. And there's not a mechanism to add those other documents from out-of-state convictions to the record on appeal. When we have tried to, um, we have been met with objections from the state because the appellate rules and the Kansas statutes do not allow the addition of those documents. Um, so that is something that the legislature has said no to, that this court's rules have said no to, 
Um, right. And I think that we're without an option there, which tells us that the scope of what appellate courts can do in fact finding. Um, Your Honor, I- Or certainly that if we adopted the state's position, you would have been unable to, to pr make the proof that they are asking that you would have made. That's right, Your Honor, which is another reason that we should decide this case on the face of the statutes. So you're saying this um, requirement part of it just makes everything easier for everyone. It's just going to be a non-person felony if it's it, it, circumstance is not required in the out-of-state statute. Yes, Your Honor. Two things. First of all, uh, you didn't produce the journal entry, right? And it no. could have shown, right? That's true. It could have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and second of all, so it's so your position is that the legislature, if there's a statute in any of the other 49 states that talks about burglary, um, and it's the, um, you know, there's uh, nine subsections uh, on burglary, and the, every one of them includes a dwelling, and then the the ninth one though doesn't mention dwelling. It was the intention of our legislature to say, oh, well, we don't want to count that. I, knowing our legislature, don't know that that is what they intended, but I think that is what the plain text of the statute they wrote requires. And that is based on what? Subsection little triple I. And that is, and tell me exactly what, what language in there? Shall be classified as a non-person felony if the elements of the offense do not require proof of any of the circumstances listed in the above subsection. Do not require require proof. The word require. Require. Yes. So it's all based on the word require. Right. Which is the word this court interpreted in Bush. No, but 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 in Bush is completely distinguishable because there was nothing in that statute. It wasn't a divisible statute. It didn't, you know, in this statute, they talk about dwelling, dwelling. I think they would say the word dwelling three times in this statute. There was no dwelling mentioned in the other statute. Actually, what I understood, the criminal trespass was the only divisible one. And it had a misdemeanor component and a felony component. The felony component required residential presence, correct? Right, and the PSI noted residential on it. Right, but I'm talking, I was actually talking about not the trespass one, but the, the other one. Right, the other one had nothing. nothing that required a residence, correct. Okay, thank you for allowing me extra time. Um, I see my time has expired. May I briefly conclude? We would ask that this court find that this is a legal classification, an issue of law, and remand the case for resentencing with instructions on how to properly classify the out-of-state prior conviction. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel for your arguments today. The court will take this appeal under advisement.